that our God saves and our God reigns. We lift you up, up, we'll let it be known that love has come and love has won. We lift you up, sing
Hey, family and friends, I pray and trust that you've enjoyed the time in worship. I pray that it has touched your heart, has even excited you for the word of God that we're about to study on today. As again, we're coming to the last and final lesson in the life of Joseph as we have utilized his life as a case study as it relates to the unhindered life, the life that is victorious. Because again, we've started off this whole study with this particular thought and thesis in mind that ultimately how we live the unhindered life is based upon our willingness to trust God in the whole process as we walk with him, as we obey him, as we have faith in him, and as we do those things that God has asked of us to live, to, to do. Because ultimately, as it relates to living life, you and I will either live life as a victim of our life circumstances or as a victor over our life circumstances. And that is in essence what we see in and through the life of Joseph. And so today we're coming to this final lesson as it relates to his life. And we're dealing with this whole concept as it relates to profiting from our problems. How do we profit? How do we gain from our problems? Because again, we oftentimes view problems as a liability, but I wanna submit and suggest to you that they can also be an asset. And so we're now in Genesis chapter 50, verse one down to verse number 26. And I would encourage you that during your devotional time, during your leisure time, that you would take the time to read Genesis chapter number 50. And so we're going to again talk about this whole aspect of how to profit from our problems. And in doing so, you and I must again come to a point in place that we begin to process life from a different point of view. Instead of asking God why, we should rather ask God what? In other words, we oftentimes say, God, why are you allowing this to happen? That's the common response when we have problems, is it not? Instead, I wanna to suggest to you that we should ask God, what are you trying to teach me through this? Not why am I going through this? Because we all go through things in life, but what are you trying to teach me through this? And again, in the previous chapter, you may recall that God, of course, took Jacob to a spiritual mountaintop experience wherein he revealed to him the future of his descendants, of his sons. And when Jacob had finished sharing his prophecy with his sons, it is here that we see in chapter 49, verse number 33, and he was gathered to his people. Now this is the final chapter and we find three principles of how you and I can profit from problems. And here's the first thing that we see, grieve hopefully. Grieve hopefully. It is in chapter 50, verse one down to verse number 14, where again, Joseph beloved's father has now died. He fell asleep, and as a result of falling asleep, denoting death, the Bible makes mention of how they begin to weep and begin to kiss him. And Joseph is a wonderful example of the fact that we all go through grief. And in going through grief, we all shed tears. He is now weeping because his father is dead. And in doing so, he now express his emotions through the process of weeping. And please note again that this whole process of weeping does not reveal weakness, but rather, nor does it reveal a lack of faith. Because oftentimes when people go through a season of grief, we denote that's a, a, an indication of weakness and or we say that person is lacking faith. But rather, tears is the way that we reveal our love to God. And tears is also the way that we reveal and it give expression to the pains that we are now facing. And so you and I should never interfere with a person who's going through a process of grief because grieving as is seen even in the life of Joseph is normal. It's natural. It is necessary. Grieving is normal. Everyone grieves. It's natural. Even Jesus wept. It's necessary because it is the path towards our healing. And notice again that even as we grieve, Paul says that we, we have a different attitude, a disposition of grieving, not like those who have no hope as is seen in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 13. 
And so notice what happens in the text. Joseph orders the physicians to embalm his father, as was the practice of the Egyptians. And in doing so, an Egyptian process took 40 days. The Egyptian mourned for Jacob 50 days or 70 days, excuse me, as is seen in chapter 50, verse two down to verse number three. And the 70 days included 40 days, which was the embalming process and 30 days of the Hebrews mourning. And then with his keeping to his father's promise, Joseph makes his special request of Pharaoh, as is seen in chapter 50, verse number five, to bury his father in the land of Canaan. Because again, it was here that God had given this land as the promised land for his people, namely Israel. And so we find here again that Joseph goes and makes this special request to Pharaoh and says, allow me to now go bury my father in the land of Canaan. And with Joseph, or better yet, with Pharaoh's permission, Joseph now arranges to have one of the most spectacular detailed funeral processions that has ever been recorded in the biblical record. Pharaoh, of course, knows that Egypt owes a lot of its fortunes to the father of the one who had just died and to the one to whom he's just given permission to, to take his father back to Canaan, being that of Joseph. It was because of Joseph that they did not starve to death. It was because of Joseph that they were strategically prepared even for the famine that took place. And as a result of such, they are now all coming to show respect even to Jacob in this processional that includes all of the Egyptian dignitarians and even Joseph family and even Jacob's sons. They are all now gathered together with the chariots and with the horsemen. And this made up a very large and even impressive entourage as is seen in Genesis chapter 50, verse seven down to verse number nine. And ultimately, as they do so, they go through this whole process. And in going through this process, they are showing respect to Jacob, who now has died, even as Joseph is showing honor to his father. And in doing so, Joseph is also revealing his humanity. Again, as stated, he was going through a process of grieving. And I can't emphasize this enough that although Joseph has power and prominence and an amazing position and all of the creature comforts that one could ever imagine in and through life, Joseph also is in touch with his emotions and in being in touch in his emotion, with his emotions, he gives expression to his vulnerability. In other words, he gives expression to the pain, to the agony that he feels within. And he recognized that weeping is not a sign of weakness. He grieves. I want to submit and suggest to you that part of our healing, again, is our ability to go through the grieving process of whatever form of loss we have experienced. It is not just the loss of a loved one, but the loss of a job, loss of a relationship, the loss of good health. Loss come in so many different forms, in so many different shapes, in so many different ways. But here is one of the key principles that we learn again from Joseph as it relates to this whole process of how do we profit from our problems and our pains? We must learn how to grieve hopefully. And here's one particular biblical verse that you and I ought to hold to while we're in the midst of grief. It is Psalm 62, verse number eight. Trust in him at all times. Ye people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Catch that key phrase. Pour out your heart before him. Why? Because God is our refuge and we're to trust in God at all times. Good times, the bad times, the times that we're up, the times that we're down, the times that we're glad and even the times that we are grieving. So here it is. Grieve hopefully. Second of all, live lovingly. It is now again in chapter number 50, verse 15 down to verse number 21. And I encourage you again to read the passage that now that their father is gone, Jacob has now closed his eyes in death. The brothers now fear that Joseph 
will again take revenge on them. They knew, of course, that Joseph deeply loved his father and would not allow that moment of his father being alive. Would not allow his father to experience again pain over again as Joseph would, as they were so thinking, seek to get revenge over them. And so they end up sending a message to Joseph saying, now that our father is, is dead, Joseph, we're willing to come and bow before you and we're willing to become your servants. And the Bible says something that is interesting. Now that Jacob is dead and after they have sent messengers, messengers to Joseph saying that we're willing to become your servants and they're asking Joseph again, would you please forgive us? Joseph receives the message and the text says in chapter 50, verse 15 down to verse 17, that Joseph weeps again. He's weeping, first of all, over his father's death. But he's weeping the second time now in the same chapter because of his brother's sense that he hasn't forgiven them. And so we see that Joseph wept yet again. And Joseph is weeping because he now feels that his brothers have still held on to this potential attitude that somehow and some way at some strategic moment after Jacob is dead and gone, that Joseph is going to retaliate against them. Could you imagine that? That they're walking around even while Jacob is alive, still thinking, yeah, he probably have forgiven us slightly, somewhat. But as soon as Pop is gone and Daddy has died, Joseph is going to retaliate. And so they really felt, in essence, that Joseph is is having what is known as postponed revenge. And deep down in their hearts, they are still think, thinking that Joseph heart is not really pure, that his forgiveness is not really authentic, and that at some strategic moment after Jacob is dead, that somehow in some way he's going to retaliate, which in essence is simply saying this, that the brothers still held something in their hearts as it relates to their false assumption about Joseph. Same is true with us, that we oftentimes go throughout life with this perceived notion of someone else's bitterness towards us, hatred for us, revenge and malice heart that they have towards us. And can I tell you why Joseph brothers really still felt, I still was feeling as if Joseph was going to retaliate against them because their father now is dead. It is not because of what Joseph held in his heart as much as it was the guilt and the shame and condemnation that Joseph brothers held in their hearts. They couldn't let it go. Guilt, shame, condemnation has held them as prisoners. And as a result of such in fear, Joseph brothers again comes to Joseph, falls down before him. And says in verse number 18 of chapter 50, we will become your servants. Again, Joseph brothers are dealing with guilt, dealing with shame, dealing with condemnation. They are dealing with, here it is, a heart that has not received forgiveness. So forgiveness is not just something that we extend, but it is also something that we receive. So I want you to pause for a brief moment and just just take inventory of your life. Could you still be living and operating in an environment where because you have not received forgiveness, you still have this attitude that this person is still after you still have some sort of vindictive, spiteful, vengeful attitude towards you. And it could well be not them as much as it could be you. And so again, 
twice, Joseph reiterates in verse number 19 and verse number 21 that he's forgiven them, that he, he's over it. And he also asked them if he, listen to what he says in verse number 19, Joseph says, says, let me tell you why I'm over it. He says and asks him, is he in the place of God? Here's what Joseph says. At the end of the day, I'm not God. I'm not the one that you have to give an account to for your actions against me. In other words, Joseph understood that vengeance belongs to the Lord as is seen in Romans 12 and verse number 19. So Joseph got over it, though his brothers were still harboring it. And Joseph was able to get over it. Why? Here it is. How did Joseph get to a place that he was no longer harboring anything in his heart? First of all, he recognized that he was not in the place of God, that God ultimately is the one who will address all the wrongs. And even beyond that, all of the unfair treatment that has come against us. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And so to let his brothers know he has forgiven him, Joseph goes as far as to say, now I haven't forgotten what you've done. Because again, there's this false notion that forgiveness equates to forgetfulness as if somehow in some way that incident, that injury, that insult, that assault, that happened has somehow in some way been radically, completely eradicated and erased from your life. No, here's what Joseph says, what you meant for evil, which implies that Joseph was still mindful of what happened. But how was Joseph able to get over it? He said, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people. And so the statement reveals that what enabled Joseph to endure the years of injustice, the cruelty, the pain, the agony that his brothers had projected against him, he says that God had a greater purpose behind even all of that. Now, Joseph doesn't say what happened to me was good. He says, no, what you meant for evil, that was evil. God somehow, some way have sovereignly worked it out where I profit out of my pain, where I profit out of my problems. He says, in other words, that God had a good purpose for all of the problems. And if you don't believe that again, look at what Romans 8, 28 says. And we know that all things are not good that happen but God can make them work together for the good to them who love God and to them who've been called according to his purpose. And so I hear you saying, well, pastor, what good could have come out of that? One of the goods that came out of Joseph's experience was his maturity. I want to suggest to you that a lot of the misery that we experience in life is, a, is designed for our maturity, that God would take misery, and will divinely process the misery of our past life and pain and utilize it for the maturity of our profit and productivity. Matter of fact, what is interesting is that Joseph, of course, became the prime minister at the age of 30. And what called Joseph to mature enough and become the second man with power and authority at such a young age, it was how he processed his pains and his problems. Because ultimately, it is the misery in life that brings our maturity in life. James tells us that the testing of our faith develops steadfastness or endurance. Or here's what the text says, patience, as is seen in James 1 and 3. Then when steadfastness or endurance has come to full effect, we are perfect. Better yet, we are mature. We are complete, lacking in nothing needed to serve God. And so the two most important words, again, in Genesis 
50 verse 20 are these words, but God. But God, one of the most exciting sermon series that I'm giving some consideration to preaching is the but God verses in scripture. That we see not just but God, what you meant for evil, but God meant it for good. We see that besides Genesis 15, verse number 20, but we also see it in Psalms 49, verse number 15. It says, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall reward me. Even as it relates to our condemnation and how we all deserve death. It is Romans 5 and 8 says, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if we're going to profit from our problems, we must never forget most in two, the two most important words in scripture, but God, all the stuff that has happened, but God, all the pains, but God, all the tears, but God, all of the heart aches, but God, all of the heartbreaks, but God, all the stuff that has happened to you, the cruelty, the insult, the injuries, but God meant it for good. So here it is. We go through the whole process of grieving. Hopefully we go through the process wherein we live lovingly. But then we also come to this final place in life where we die confidently. When we come to the end of life, we want to come to the end of life, as was the case with even Joseph, because Joseph lived in Egypt about 50 years after even Jacob had died. And at the age of 110 years, he even lives to see his great, great grandchildren, Ephraim and his great grandchildren, Manasseh. And Joseph tells his brothers in chapter number 50, verse number 24, that he will soon die. And then notice what the text says. He says, and Joseph says to them in verse number 24, and Joseph said unto his brothers, I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of the land unto the land which he swears to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. And so he dies, of course, with this same sort of, of hopeful expectation in the promises of God that even his father Jacob had, that it is from this promised land that God is going to bless. It is from this promised land that God has given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and had prophetic, prophetically declared, excuse me, that it was their land, that even Joseph says that God is going to visit you there. He dies with this whole confidence that God is true to his word. So how do you and I profit from our pains? How do we profit from the seasons of loss and the season of, 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 of setbacks and obstacles in and through life? We hold confidently to the promises of God, even tenaciously till we come to the very end of our lives. Joseph, all the way from the pit, all the way we oftentimes end his life at the palace, but no, all the way even to the grave when he is at the point of death, he says, God, I'm still holding to that promise that you gave. So we grieve. We go through that whole process. We come to that process where in again, we love. We choose not to live life with unforgiveness in our hearts. We come to the end of life like Joseph with confidence that God is still going to hold to his promise and every promise that God has made, it shall come to pass. Matter of fact, you're perhaps right now in a season in your life where you're looking at all of the pain that you've endured. And you're asking, how do I handle this? Here it is. Let the pain bring you to a place of grief because your weeping is not a sign of your weakness. Your weakness, your weeping is a sign of your vulnerability as it relates to, here it is. I'm willing to express God, I need you in this moment. It's designed to bring you to a point in place that you're able to say, I can't do this without God. And I'm trusting in God that God would deliver me out of this. I come to that pain, resolving that I'm not going to hold any bitterness, any 
malice type of attitude or thoughts in my heart towards those who caused the greatest pain in my life. And oftentimes, as was the case with Joseph, sometimes the greatest pain that comes in life comes from the people who are closest to you in life. From the very circle of family and one circle outside of that, friends. Oh, you already anticipate the foes would do what they do, but it's nothing as grievous, painful, like the pain that comes from family and friends. But even when they cause pain, practice what is seen in Joseph's life, practice the principle of forgiveness because it ends up, hurt, ends up hurting you more when you harbor hatred and revenge and bitterness in your heart, as opposed to having that attitude, what you meant for evil, that was evil, it did hurt. I'm acknowledging it for what it was, yet I also see that God has worked it out for the good. And then hold with confidence onto the promises of God, that every promise that God has declared shall come to pass. Every single promise that God has ever declared shall come to pass. Here's one verse that I want to leave you with as it relates to when it seems as if our purpose is eluding us and we're in that season of pain and we must come to a point in place that we try to resolve how to respond. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples the night before the most tragic experience that they would end up enduring his crucifixion. Notice what Jesus says and tells to his disciples, tells his disciples in John chapter 13, verse 17. What I do, thy knowest not, but thy shall know hereafter. In other words, there's some things that have happened in your life. You're like, Lord, what is this? I don't understand why. But God, I trust you that in time, you will give revelation to this season in my life. And at some point, I'll come to understand that that pain, that hurt, you've used to help mature me, to help me to live the unhindered life. Friends, listen, I pray that you've been blessed by the life of Joseph. His life and his biographical sketch is one of the most intriguing stories and narratives of the unhindered life. And I pray that you've been blessed as we have taken our time for weeks, yay, months, just walking through the life of Joseph. I hope he was able to see how so many of the pitfalls and experiences and twists and turns, ups and downs, ins and out, mountains and valleys of his life reflects the journey of our lives. Let me pray with you. Father, how we thank you again for this day. We thank you for your word and we thank you for the life of Joseph that has helped us to see how indeed we can live the unhindered life. I pray God that that in which we've learned that we would apply it, that we might live victorious. In Jesus name, amen.